Hi, my name is Pelly Anderson. I joined the Gun Violence Prevention Movement because I was tired of providing only thoughts and prayers and no action in general. For my children, I know we can do better. Joining Brady has allowed us to take action to end gun violence in America. Hi everyone, my name is Ivan Garcia, I'm 17 years old, and I'm a part of the Human Rights and Gun Violence Prevention Movement because I grew up living the daily effects of gun violence. I grew up in a community that has been plagued with crime and gun violence for decades now. So this is not an issue. As a child, I would wake up and I would go to bed hearing gunshots left and right. I also know the first-hand effects of having people in power, having politicians not listen to you, look over your, your concerns. And I am tired of not having my voice heard. I'm tired of losing and, and having more people get hurt because of guns. There is a way to keep our community safe, and it's time for us to act. So I am so grateful to be a part of this movement with people all around this country to keep each other safe. Hello, my name Hello. is Judy Wilson. I live in Stockton, California. I became involved with gun violence prevention sometime after the Indian School Massacre, where we lost five of our precious children. This name Chan is a bird. It makes our our entire community, our, our community world has lost. I think of how old she would be now and what impact she would be able to play in her community. I hope that with joining Brady, who has a bigger voice than our group of Cleveland School Remembers, we can do more to prevent gun violence. Good afternoon to all our members and supporters in California, and good evening to those on the East Coast. My name is Amanda Wilcox, and I'm the legislative advocate for Brady, California. Just a little bit about me. I've always cared about gun violence and financially supported Brady since the 1980s. And after my daughter Laura was killed in 2001, I realized I needed to do more to get a year. So I hooked up with the California Bridge Captors. In 2005, I became the legislative advocate for Brady in California. So I gave a presentation a year at a Brady California conference, and I always try to provide context around events and her politics. Um, but since we likely had new people joining us this year, as well as people from out of state, I wanted to broaden my presentation to cover the last 30 years of firearm legislation in California. Typically, my presentations are more interactive and it's possible on Zoom. And these will be able to submit questions through the Zoom platform QA function. So I don't see the slide presentation up yet, but hopefully it will be in a moment. Thank you. So I'm calling this a 30 year journey of firearm legislation. If you could go to the next slide, please, please. So every year I feel a lot of questions about uh, the legislative process in California and how it becomes law. Um, so this diagram I think is very helpful. A bill can be introduced in either house in the California legislature, can be introduced in our state assembly or in our state senate. On this uh, diagram here, you can view the yellow 
boxes as the progress of a bill through one house, and then the blue boxes as the progress of a bill moving through the opposite house. So uh, let's assume it's an assembly bill that is introduced. Um, in the bills introduced, the top yellow box there in the assembly, um, the first uh, step is after a month, they allow to uh, proceed through the committee hearing process. Our farm bills generally go to the public safety committees. Uh, then the next committee, the bills go to the appropriations committee, which looks at the cost. If it passes those two committees, then it goes to the floor. In this case, the assembly floor for a vote. If the bill is passed by the full assembly, it then proceeds to the opposite house. So my hypothetical example be now going to the Senate, and we go through the same committee process in the Senate, the South Safety, the Preparations Committee, and then to the full Senate for, for a vote. If the bill is not changed or amended in the Senate, it would go to the governor's desk. Uh, if the bill wasn't am amended in the Senate, we go back to the first house, which would be the assembly, in my example, where they would have to concur, so we say, on the bills that uh, amendments that were taken in the Senate. If the, um, if the second, the original house passes the uh, concurrent to the amendments, then the bill goes to the governor. The governor has 30 days to sign or veto a bill. Right now, we have six firearm bills on the governor's desk. And he has until next Wednesday, September 30th, uh, to sign or veto the bills. Next slide, please. I also get a lot of questions about terminology, um, and particularly um, there's confusion with the terms that are used in Washington, D.C. So, for example, um, in California, we call it the assembly. And nationally, it's referred to as House, I think, as in other states as well. In California, the author of the bill, uh, we call it the author, I know nationally they call it sponsor. In California, the sponsor is the organization, such as Brady, that uh, came up with the policy and the provisions of the bill and found the author to carry it. Uh, the suspense file is. Um, where bills that have a certain cost are held in suspense, quote unquote, in the appropriations committee, and all those bills with cost are considered in one day. So that, that way, bills with costs are all considered together, voted on together uh, before they go to the floor for a vote. The third reading of the bill means it's ready to be voted on by the floor. First reading when the bills are introduced, second reading when the bills then passed by committee, third reading, which after a period of time has passed, it was ready to be considered by a full Senate or full assembly. A got amended bill is um, a bill that is where the contents of the bill were stripped out and different languages inserted in the bill. This year, we had a large number of bills that were not amended because um, after the shooting with George Floyd, um, there was, of course, heightened concern about police reforms and police issues. So a number of legislators struck the contents of the bill and inserted um, policing, a bill related to policing. When a bill is pulled by the author, uh, it generally means that they know they do not have the votes to pass the bill in committee, and rather have, rather than having the bill heard and die, uh, a full from being considered in a hearing. Uh, hell, a bill held in committee means did not get enough votes to pass. A bill on all means that the votes have happened, but the vote has not been closed yet. And um, the, there's still an opportunity for votes to have the bill to pass. And then finally, a trailer bill is a bill that um, uh, puts in code or implements the language that is in the California budget bill. And I'm going to look at the chat for a minute because it appears that there may be some tech issues here.
Okay, so they want me to switch by phone. Not answering it. I'm still waiting for a number to call. I will continue. They can continue the slideshow, please. I mean, the meeting might be then. Okay, I, hopefully people can hear me better now. If we can move back to the slideshow. Pass terminology to the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, the turning point in California was in 1989 when the Stockton schoolyard shooting happened. Uh, this was a Cleve, a, um, a shooting at Cleveland Elementary School where a gunman killed five school children and wounded 32 others. His victims were predominantly Southeast Asian. And in California, our legislature did more than just thoughts and prayers. The response was bipartisan, and under Governor George Duke Majan, who is a Republican, 
uh, the nation's first assault weapons law was passed in which 65 weapons were banned. Also, uh, a year later in 1990, AB 497 was passed, a very significant bill that required universal background checks, a waiting period, expanded prohibited persons, and authorized DOJ to keep a record of who had purchased a handgun. So uh, those were significant bills passed early on. And then the next year, uh, Governor Wilson by then was had been elected, and he assigned uh, signed a bill to strengthen the assault weapons ban to include copycat weapons and um, required a basic handgun safety certificate on firearm purchasers. So those, those uh, two years are very significant in California's history of gun laws. But over the next seven years, a number of significant bills reached Governor New- Wilson's desk, and he vetoed all of them. Just so you know, Brady at this time really was in the forefront of the efforts in California, both in 89 and afterwards, and worked and convened a coalition of groups in California, um, and was very much part of this effort. Eventually, they um, merged with the Bell Campaign, which was a grassroots organization of victims. But we've had ver- a very strong coalition and organization in California, really, since the early 90s. Um, so next, next slide, please. So 1999 was another pivotal year in California. Uh, Governor Gray Davis ran on guns and it was inaugurated in January 99. Then in April, the shooting happened at Columbine High School, on which 12 students and one teacher were killed. It was um, the deadliest school shooting in in history, U.S. history at that time. And then in August, the Jewish Community Center shooting uh, in Granada Hills near Los Angeles happened where a white supremacist walked into a community center where there's a camp for children, opened fire, and uh, wounded five people, three children, a teenager, and an uh, office worker there uh, at the center. So that, of course, uh, highlighted the issue in California as well as for our nation. And that year, in 1999, Governor Gray Davis signed what we call the Grand Slam of gun bills, including a stronger assault weapons ban, which I'll talk about more later, and um, uh, the Unsafe Handgun Act, which required consumer product safety standards, specifically a drop test and firing safety test, Um, for handguns sold in California. So those are very significant policies. Next slide, please. Uh, Meanwhile, the momentum on the issue kept building. Uh, I'm sure many of you participated in the Million Mom March in um, Mother's Day in May 2000. This was um, organized by Donna Dees Thomas, Thomas and others. Uh, She was in She was motivated to do this after the shooting at the Jewish Community Center. Um, And between the march in Washington and satellite satellite marches around the country, um, a million million citizens um, marched to take a stand for stricter gun laws. Next slide, please. So Sacramento, likewise, had marches both in uh, 2000 and 2001. Um, there on the top left slide is Teresa Stark, who at the time was the leader of our Sacramento chapter. Uh, the bottom right slide is Senator Don Parada, who's the one who carried the assault weapons law. And then the other hero for us here in California, Senator Scott, the bottom middle slide, uh, who authored many sig- of our significant gun laws. Next slide, please. So with all these uh, bills, with all this momentum and publicity around gun violence prevention and these horrific shootings that happened, um, we were in a good position to get a lot of bills signed by Governor Davis. And um, as I mentioned earlier, he signed a significant bill related to the assault weapons law, uh, strengthened it uh, to rather than just name models to um, cover certain features of these guns, he established basic handgun safety standards. Uh, he passed, signed a law that prohibits uh, purchase of more than one handgun in a 30-day period, which is very significant for deterring gun trafficking. Um, a bill was passed whereby handgun records can be used to catch people who are 
uh, illegally possessing guns, uh, a a law that even strengthened the the handgun safety certificate to include a written test and a um, safety demonstration. He repealed gun industry immunity in California, as you probably know that (laughs) unfortunately uh, the national PLACA law was passed, which uh, preempted the immunity, the repeal of immunity that we did in California. And then he um, also signed a bill requiring handguns to have a chamber load indicator or magazine disconnect to help prevent unintentional shootings. In the bottom box there, Griffin Dix, whose son Kenzo was killed in an unintentional shooting, he advocated very hard for particularly that last bill I mentioned, as well as Mary Lee Black and her son, uh, Mary Lee Black, whose son was killed by a Saturday night special, and um, the basic hand, handgun safety standards that Davis signed essentially got rid of those, uh, what we call junk guns. So those are very significant policies passed. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to say a little bit about um, assault weapons. The gun lobby likes to say that um, we don't like assault weapons because we don't like how they look. Um, that is not the reason why we, are, we have such strong opposition to um, assault weapons. It's really about how these weapons function and how they allow a shooter to maintain control uh, while they rapidly reload the gun and can contain can maintain continuous fire, this enables a shooter to keep shooting and kill many people very quickly. Um, so the bill that was passed in 1999 that Gray, Gray Davis signed switched from naming models to um, prohibiting a combination of features. Um, and here's this diagram shows how um, the different parts of a assault weapon. Probably the most common one people think of is the pistol grip, Um, but there's also the thumb hole stock, the sliding stock, uh, shoulder stock. These are features that allow the shooter to maintain aim and control. And if those features are combined with an exchangeable, with an exchangeable magazine, whereby the shooter can quickly reload, then these weapons are particularly lethal. So the 99 bill said that you can only, if you have the, um, an exchangeable magazine, you can only have one of these other features. Um, so next uh, slide, please. So, uh, Gray Davis, Governor Davis was recalled and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger became our governor from in 1993, I believe. Um, he's a Republican. Davis was a Democrat. He was a Republican, uh, European, from Europe, and I think had a different view about guns and uh, kind of bucked his party to sign a number of our gun laws. He signed a ban on 50 caliber sniper rifle, rifles in 2004. Um, the, uh, the, um, a law requiring handguns to have a micro stamping feature uh, in 2007, and I will circle back to that later, and then also a law regulating ham- handgun ammunition sales. Uh, under that law, ham- ammunition sales had to occur in a face-to-face transaction. Um, they had to be stored in a way that the customer didn't have ready access to it, and um, the seller of, informi- of the ammunition had to keep a log, which they could provide to law enforcement of ammunition buyers, which could be used for investigative purposes. Um, we, Governor Schwarzenegger had a signing ceremony for AB 962 down in Los Angeles. And so uh, a number of our chapter members down there from Orange County, San Fernando Valley chapter, Los Angeles chapter, were invited to be there for the um, signing ceremony. And as we can see, our bell that we always ring at our conferences, we had the governor ring that in honor of victims lost to gun violence. Next slide, please. So um, meanwhile, we continued our act- activity and presence around the state. In the top left, chapter member Griffin Dix was on a panel uh, regarding the iron pipeline or guns going uh, across the border to Mexico. 
Uh, the top middle one was, I believe, a vigil on the anniversary of um, the Tucson shooting. On the right, we see our Contra Costa t- chapter doing tabling. They love doing tabling events and particularly promoting the Ask campaign. Down on the bottom right, we one of our conferences, we gave an award to Chief Ken James. He was the chief of the Firearms Committee for the California Police Chiefs Association, and we had a close and good working relationship with him for many years. Another vigil, I think maybe on the anniversary of Virginia Tech in the middle. Um, then you can see the little flyer on Measure C, the city of Sunny. Sunnyvale successfully passed a measure that banned um, possession of large capacity magazines and a number of other provisions, and um, that was enacted by the city of Sunnyvale. And many of our gun laws, state laws, were first passed as local ordinances, which provided momentum uh, for the eventual uh, statewide enactment of those policies. And then above that is a lion that we did up here in Nevada County, where I live, on the, the anniversary of the Virginia, Virginia Tech shooting. So we stayed active. Uh, we kept the issue visible and continued to make progress in the California legislature. So if you could do the next slide, please. So after Obama was elected in 2008, uh, we started to see a surge of these open carry protests, I think around the nation and certainly in our state. Um, And Contra Costa County was sort of ground zero with this, with some of the key proponents, but also there were protests in San Diego and Los Angeles and uh, around the state. And they were very problematic for law enforcement Um, They, of course, didn't know the intentions of people open carrying a handgun, uh, didn't know if that was a good guy or a bad guy with a gun, and, of course, uh, customers and passive buyers felt very nervous and intimidated by this practice. They did a lot of meetups at Starbucks. So when there's a problem like that, you know, when we pass legislation, we try and do it to address the problem. This became a problem in California. So the next year, we start working on legislation. Next slide, please. So um, we passed a bill to to prohibit the open carry of handguns in 2011. Uh, The gun lobby was very upset about that bill and said, okay, well, then we're going to open carry our long guns. And so after this this bill was went to effect, we started pe- seeing people with long guns slung over their shoulder walking down streets and through malls in California. So what did we do? Of course, we passed a bill to prohibit the open carry of long guns in California. That's how we do it. Also in 2011, um, we passed a bill requiring the preservation of records for long guns. This is actually one of my favorite bills that I ever worked on. It, um, it, you know, I strongly believe that long guns and handguns should be treated in the same manner. Um, Brady believes that as well. And these long, long gun records were very important to be, um, to uh, identify uh, criminals, This would be records of anyone who bought a long gun in California, and it would help to solve gun crime, uh, identify gun traffickers, um, disarm people who who had guns in the system and had a restraining order or committed a crime and were now prohibited in a way to disarm them. It was also a way to keep law enforcement safe because if they're on a call, they can look in the database and see uh, what kind of guns this person owned, if any, and take um, more precautionary measures as they respond. So that was a really important bill that we passed in 2011. Uh, Both the open carry bill and the long gun bill um, died their first year that we moved them. Back in those days, we only had, uh, we just had the votes we needed in the Senate and two members were very ill and missed at the end of session and we did not have the votes. So we uh, reintroduced them the next year and were able to get them passed. That is often the case where we do not get a bill passed the first year, but we generally do uh, the next year or the following year. So we do need to take a bit of a long-term view in terms of the progress that we make. Okay, next slide, please. So 
So interestingly enough, um, Sandy, the year after Sandy Hook, which was 2013, was not a very successful year here in California. Governor Brown made a statement right off that now is not the time to overact with gun bills. Brown is actually somewhat of a libertarian on this issue. He's never liked gun bills. Um, the standing comment we have and that his staff had is that he would hold his nose and sign a bill. You know, it was up to us to make the case. Um, the Senate, the pro tem of the Senate, the leader of the Senate, Daryl Steinberg, is on the bottom right picture there at one of the press conferences we did. He uh, shepherded a package through called the Life Act. Uh, it was an ambitious package of eight bills, um, and almost all of them failed. Most of them were vetoed by the governor. Um, one of the bills he had was really to try and do a final fix for our assault weapons law where no guns with exchangeable magazines, no long guns with exchangeable magazines could be sold, period. We also had a bill to uh, prohibit large capacity magazine possession, which deals with those magazines that were, all, were grandfathered in when the 99 law was passed. Um, those bills all failed. We did, however, get an appropriation of $24 million for our armed prohibited person system program. This is a program where um, someone who bought a gun legally, and we have a record of it now, whether it's a handgun or long gun, and then subsequently they become prohibited uh, because of a crime, criminal conviction, or a mental health um, a commitment or a restraining order, law enforcement's uh, databases check each other and see when a person has a gun, their arm, but they are prohibited from possessing a gun, and then they uh, go to try and disarm the person. It's very proactive to disarm people with prohibitions before they do harm. Um, the other part of the Life Act, the other bill signed was um, applying the handgun safety certificate program to all to all firearms, which would include long guns, which is a long-standing goal of ours to treat them the same. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Governor Brown, even though he didn't like gun bills and held his nose when he signed them. <laughs> He continued to sign some very significant bills, including the gun violence restraining order law in 2014. Um, this was a bill that was gotten amended. Um, a, AB 2014 was the bill, and it was already it was assembly bill already in the Senate. Then the shooting happened in May 2014 uh, at Isla Vista near the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and in that incident, uh, three people were still killed, I believe. Uh, a number were killed, some by stabbing, but three were shot to death. Um, and it became known that the shooter had a number of mental health and emotional issues, um, but he had never had an involuntary mental health hold in California. He had not committed a crime, and therefore he did not have a firearm prohibition. And it became very clear it was such a good example of how someone can be dangerous. People around that person worried about them. Uh, the, the shooter's parents were in this case, yet there's no legal tool for removing his weapons. And so we did a gotten the men, quote unquote, and stripped the language of the bill and put in the gun violence restraining order language uh, and worked very hard to get it passed. The, the first committee in the opposite house, the Senate committee, um, the consultants in the chair did not like the bill, and they were um, prepared to hold it in committee, uh, but we were able to flip the chair and get the bill through and get it to the governor, and he signed it. And along that way, we built a very broad support list. I think everyone gets it, that there are times when people are dangerous, they should not have a firearm, access to a firearm, even though they don't have a firearm prohibition under current law. Uh, and then a few other bills that the governor signed. Next slide, please. So uh, 2016 was really a wild ride for us. The preceding fall in um, October, I guess, October 2015, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, he's then Lieutenant Governor Newsom, um, announced that he was going to do a proposition or initiative uh, with some gun control measures in it. Um, 
among the issues was background checks for ammunition purchases. The leader of the Senate, uh, Senator de Leon, who's the second picture there uh, next to Governor Newsom, uh, was furious. The ammo uh, regulating ammunition sales was his key uh, policy issue, and he was furious that Newsom was taking this policy and wanted to move it as legislation. Meanwhile, Governor Brown and the pro tem, de Leon, did not want this legislation on the ballot. They were worried who would bring it, the voters would bring out, and how it would impact other uh, initiatives that they really cared about on the ballot. So the pro tem had this idea that let's quick pass some of the same policies through legislation so that Gover Lieutenant Governor Newsom will drop uh, his package of firearm bills. And so we, um, we can't, there's about 15 bills in the package. They were moved quickly through, and there's the little uh, TV screen with me where 10 bills were passed uh, in one day by committee. I mean, it was a lot of firearm bills moving at once. But we got them to the governor early in June, and he signed seven bills in one day. All this was in hopes that Newsom would drop his initiative. Um, also, the other significant legislation passed that year was um, establishing and funding the UC California Firearm Research Center, uh, which is doing helpful research, good research as, as we speak. Um, but in that package, it included a background check system for ammunition purchases, a large cat magazine possession ban, we closed the bullet button loophole to our assault weapons law, and um, the first step in regulating ghost guns, whereby anyone who assembled uh, their own gun, they had to get a serial number for it from DOJ, with, and with that, there's a background check and record. So it's a significant package. Um, Governor Brown, again, held his nose and signed it. Newsom did not withdraw his initiative, but the fact that we had already passed so many of these policies, they're already enacted, uh, it kept the opposition off the initiative a bit. This was already law, and so the initiative with these provisions also passed. So everything was passed sort of twice that year, um, and certainly showed that Californians support these kind of measures. They passed, the initiative passed with broad support. After that, Newsom said, no more gun bills, or excuse me, Brown, Governor Brown, wanted no more gun bills. So we try to do uh, smaller, less controversial bills, you know, uh, firearm prohibition for a misdemeanor hate crime conviction, a number of GVRO, what I call cleanup bills. Um, although we did uh, raise the age for long gun purchases to 21 uh, with certain exemptions. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, uh, of course, our chapters continued their presence and activities and events around the state. Um, on the top left, I see the Ventura, Ventura chapter there, an event. Um, to the right, then San Fernando Valley. Orange County had a great tabling, tabling event where they tried to uh, hold legislators accountable for their votes. They take pictures of thanking them or sh shaming them and post it on social media. Uh, I see the Stockton Cleveland School Remember chapter doing a booth related to suicide. And on the left, San Francisco chapter in San Mateo working on um, trying to stop the gun shows at the Cow Palace there on the peninsula. So uh, we continued. We never let up with our events and actions. Next slide, please. So last year, 2019, was uh, Governor Newsom's first year as governor. Uh, as mayor of San Francisco, obviously as lieutenant governor with the initiative, we knew he was a very aligned with us and a strong supporter of gun violence prevention. And sure enough, he signed 14 bills last year, including a number of bills that we had introduced several times before, and they either didn't get to Governor Brown or he vetoed them. Uh, so again, matching handgun laws and long gun laws uh, we uh, had the one gun a month or one gun purchase in 30 days to prevent, to help uh, curb gun trafficking. We had that applied to semi-automatic rifles. Uh, so that was expanded. And um, 
we significantly stepped up the regulation um, and sale of firearm precursor parts. So under this uh, law, only a licensed precursor part vendor can sell these parts to assemble a weapon. And uh, if someone wants to buy these parts, they have to pass a background check and DOJ would have a record. That law is not in effect yet, but it will be very significant in uh, curbing the flow of ghost guns in California. Um, we also strengthen our storage and cap laws. The cap laws, our child access prevention laws, now apply to unloaded guns and long guns, as well as to unloaded handguns, strengthen GBRO um, law and the implementation, um, authorize a training program for physicians on preventing firearm-related harm. The UC Center for Firearm Research is going to develop that program, and we established the uh, CalVIP grant program to fund, to do violence intervention programs in uh, our communities hardest hit by gun violence. So um, Governor Newsom delivered. Next slide, please. So this legislative session is truly unprecedented. Um, the COVID pandemic uh, has caused a number of recess, unexpected recesses to happen where the legislature was not in session. Um, they tried to con continue with committee hearings and have the witnesses and public weigh in. There's often tech, not, tech problems with that, just like we had early on, you know how it goes. Um, where witnesses couldn't be heard. Uh, the Senate and the Assembly had some disagreement about whether um, legislators could vote remotely. They allowed certain, the Assembly said certain people at risk could vote remotely, uh, but Assemblymember Quirk there on the bottom right, who lives in a congregate care setting and could have stayed home, he chose to vote, but you can see the precautions he takes. Uh, meanwhile, Buffy Wicks there, who had a baby in July, was not excused in the assembly, so she came with her baby to, to vote. Um, then at one point, a Republican um, member tested positive the same day there's a Republican caucus meeting in the Senate, and so they were all required to vote virtually, and there were problems with that as well. So it was it's an unprecedented legislation. That said, we have six bills on the governor's desk right now. Um, he has till next Wednesday to act. And um, the most significant one of those, our priority bill, is um, AB 2847. So next slide, please. This is a bill that would facilitate the implementation of micro, the micro-stamping requirement in California. Uh, as I showed on an earlier slide, we passed this law requiring the micro-stamping feature on handguns back in 2007. It actually didn't go into effect until 2013 when um, sort of patent issues were cleared up. There's been a court challenge to our law. The gun industry has said that they can't do it. And so what um, this bill, AB 2847, does by Assemblymember Chu, David Chu, is it revises the law by requiring that um, the micro-stamping feature only be, there only be one stamp that has to occur instead of two. So if you look at the handgun on this slide, um, you can see a firing pin. The firing pin, um, when the gun is fired, the firing pin marks the bullet casing, which is the casing around the bullet when it is fired. Um, on the right, you can see the intentional marks on the tip of the firing pin, and you can see the marks, bottom right, the marks on the bullet casing. These marks, these are intentional marks that link the gun, link the, link the bullet casing to the make, model, serial number of the gun. So think of how a license plate on a car uh, links to the make, model, and, ser and VIN number of the car. It's the same thing. So think of a drive-by shooting where the only thing left, the only evidence, are these spent bullet casings. If these intentional marks are on the bullet casings, law enforcement has an early and critical lead for identifying the gun that was used 
which leads to identifying the shooter or at least the last uh, legal owner. Because micro-stamping guns have not yet come on the market, uh, essentially the gun lobby is boycotting it, we are not getting new models on the market. New models are also required to have the chamber load indicator and magazine disconnect to prevent, prevent unintentional shootings. We are not realizing those benefits either because we're not getting new models of guns on the market. Um, the gun industry has conceded they can do the one marking. So with this law, we're changing the requirement to one. We are expecting to get new models that have micro-stamping technology and these consumer safety features to prevent unintentional machines on the market in California. So it's a very significant bill. You know, the number, the percentage of, of crimes that are unsolved are very high, and they're particularly high in communities of color and really contribute to um, people trying to take justice into their own hands and, um, you know, the retaliate, retaliatory cycles of violence and trauma and vigilantism. So this is a significant bill. We're hoping the governor will sign. If you haven't already, please give him a call, urge him to sign the bill. Um, and we'll know by next week the outcome of this. Next slide, please. So this is a chart developed by um, our chapter members, or um, by two of our um, knowledgeable <laughs> uh, chapter members here in California, Griffin Dix and Laura Lee, that compares, using CDC data, compares the, the mortality rate, uh, the fire mortality rate in the United States versus the rest of the nation. California's in blue, um, the rest of the United States is in red. You can see our peak was in about 1991. Um, you know, we had just passed those strong gun laws after the Stockton Schoolyard shooting. It takes a while for those laws to get implemented, start realizing the benefit, but you can see a very significant drop in our gun death rate uh, starting about 1992 or 93. And we have continued to drop, a little bit up and down, but continue to drop. Uh, nationally, the mortality rate Drop to, of course, the Brady Background Act, Check Act was passed in 1993, um, and you know there are other things, uh, other reasons for the drops in, in both cases. Uh, emergency care improve, keeping people alive, so there are more injuries than deaths. But nonetheless, uh, California certainly has been able to drop their gun death rate more than the rest of the nation. Um, we uh, we like to think, and I think we can make the point, that our gun laws are making a difference. That data there. Um, can you move on, please? So finally, well not finally, but I'm going to think I'm going to have to short things here with the, with the audio problems. Um, there are some lessons learned in California. Um, you know, looking, looking at the history here, first of all, enacting gun laws is incremental. Now and then we have a very big bill that contains a lot of provisions that, that are passed. But normally it's one bill, one policy, sometimes one very small policy at a time, uh, passing something and then strengthening it the next year, figuring out there's a new loophole and, and passing another bill. It's just been incremental uh, year after year after year. I would offer that after a horrific shooting is the time to um, to introduce and move gun bills. Certainly we saw that after the Stockton schoolyard shooting, after Columbine and um, the JCC shooting in 1999, after the San Bernardino shooting. I didn't mention, but that, ha that also happened the same time Governor Newsom or Lieutenant Governor Newsom had introduced his initiative. And we do get momentum, the political momentum, momentum at least in California, after these high-profile horrific shootings. We also have to ch we changed our strategy as politics change. Early on, we only uh, had one priority bill, and our coalition and certainly all our chapters in California were very focused on that one bill, uh, building support. And uh, one of the big efforts we always did was to get law enforcement support for our bills. When the first micro-stamping bill was passed, we had 65 police chiefs and sheriffs in support of that legislation. 
as the politics around it change with all these shootings, with our legislature becoming bluer, um, it switched to a package of bills. And um, the, the fact that it was a gun control, quote unquote, bill wasn't really the challenge in getting our bills passed. Um, our legislators are overall, the majority are very sympathetic in California and aligned. It was more about the un un unintended consequences of our bill. First of all, is there a problem? Will the bill actually help to address that problem? And what are the unintended consequences? Are we criminalizing people who shouldn't be criminalized? Is there a disproportionate impact on people of color? What is the cost of the bill? Can it really be implemented like we say it will be? So it became much more uh, policy issues around a bill than just uh, about the issue of, of gun violence prevention in general. Um, the other part of our work is, of course, to stop, stop bad bills. Bad bills, bills we oppose, are introduced every year. And um, I think with the exception of one bill, every bill that we have posed has failed in the first policy committee hearing, except for one, which we did get amended and improved. Um, so that's a very important part of our work. Relationships really matter. I mean, we, we get into, you know, we get meetings with consultants and legislators and their staff uh, because they know us, they know our story, um, they know that we are fact-based, that we are respectful, that we speak truth, and um, really our job is to make them care and want to get these bills passed for us. And then finally, um, what I've learned over the years is that sometimes enacting the law is the easy part. Implementing it can be much more difficult, and um, that can be a topic of a later discussion. Next slide, please. Um, generally, after at our conference, I talk about the events and what's happened the preceding year. We had our conference last year, November 3rd, I think, in 2019, and then sadly, 12 days later, there is a shooting at the Hog Fogus High School uh, down in Southern California in Santa Clarita, I think it was. Um, and in that shooting, two people were killed. Uh, I think it was the first school shooting where a ghost gun was used. Um, the shooter was 16 years old. I don't think it's known whether he built the gun himself or acquired it from his father, uh, but it was an unregistered ghost gun that was used. Two students that were killed, 15-year-old uh, Gracie Ann Mulberger and Dominique Blackwell. Both were, Gracie was 15 and Dominique was 14. And Gracie's father actually will be speaking on the victim survivor panel I believe it's on Thursday later this week, and um, you'll want to hear from him. Next slide, please. And then the very next day, our chapters had the high of uh, going to the Democratic, uh, California Democratic Party Convention. Uh, and in the photo there on the top right, you can see some of our members with uh, quite a few legislators wanted to join us. So there is a lot of networking with California legislators. Brady folks were very well received, and we had a strong presence there. So that was a great day. Uh, next slide. In uh, January 2020, um, so before the, the COVID disruption, uh, we had a bill that we gotten amended and uh, was turned into a bill that would require schools to notify parents and guardians of California's um, child access prevention and firearm storage laws. And in this uh, slide, you can see Donna Finkelstein um, present. She was the lead witness uh, who's worked on this around the LA area, getting school districts to send home this notification. We want a statewide law, but meanwhile, she's having great success district to district. Peggy McCrum, our former, our past president, also testified. She's a constituent of the chair. And I think that Bill really uh, gained momentum, uh, sailed through that committee, and we're very excited about it. But unfortunately, later the bill was dropped. Uh, it got tangled up with, with the COVID impacts, I believe. Next slide. I need to finish up here. Uh, again, we continued our activity. Top left, the Women's March in Sacramento. Our Sacramento chapter was there. Uh, Orange County chapter looks like they're at a campaign event uh, for Scott Reinhardt, who's running for assembly. Um, 
bottom right, I think that's a Martin uh, Luther MLK Day um, tabling event. Team Enough, I just wanted to mention, that's actually a picture of their lobbying last year, <laughs> uh, but they obviously had to go virtual this year and um, did amazing virtual lobbying week this summer on our bills and really were well prepared and did a great job. <clears throat> But then COVID came and disrupted everything, as you know. Next slide. We do endorse candidates in California, state assembly, you can see state senate, as well as local races. And uh, in the in years when there's statewide elections, we do endorsements then as well. <clears throat> Next slide. I don't think I need to tell you all how much at stake. <laughs> Elections have consequences. We're very proud of uh, Kamala Harris being um, the vice presidential nominee um, by, uh, with Biden. They both have a great history on this issue, uh, as you can see the quotes there. Um, the Supreme Court, with what happened last week with with uh, Justice Ginsburg's death, I mean, we already knew it, but even more is at stake. And I would have to say California has probably more to lose than any state. We have the strongest gun laws. They are always being challenged. Who's on the court, on these federal courts at all levels, really, really matter to us. So vote, uh, help others vote, and get involved with Brady's campaign, Voting Acts to Save Lives. Um, Katie Porter on the top right, she was elect she ran on gun violence. She's from Orange County, which was used to be a very red county, when I think it's her third day after she is sworn in, the Brady background check bill uh, was voted on and she spoke, talked about the blacks in Orange County or chapter leaders down there. That's from Orange County. That shows how the needle is changing. Next slide. So we do this work in California, of course, in memory of the victims. And you know, our loved ones lost to gun violence. And I'll just end by um, sharing quickly who these are. Robert Kelly on the top left uh, was 28 when he was killed, the oldest son in a family, seven. <clears throat> he was shot and robbed while walking to his parked car. Killer was never found. Next to him to the right, Darren Glimstead, 19 in the prime of life, in college working past time, was shot by a troubled young man while he was at work at a Sacramento marina. Jane, Jane um, Heine, Jan Heine, beloved wife and mother, was shot by a man with history of violence who never should have access to weapons. Matthew Black, age 21, about to graduate from college, a gifted scholar, high school wrestler, was killed just walking while walking his date home. George C. Scott, age 24, father of two young black boys. The shooter was arrested and let go because there wasn't enough evidence to convict him. They put in time to the gun. And Laura Wilcox, my daughter, bright and beautiful at age 19, a high school valedictorian, shot four times at point blank range while home on winter break from Haverford College. Peter Verge, age 18, was shot in a homicide by a 33-year-old attorney. Kenzo Dix, shot by a friend, showing him his father's gun. The friend thought the gun was unloaded. And Catherine McCord, a brilliant poet, clinically depressed for years, pulled her husband's gun out of the bedside table and shot herself. We do this work in their name. May we save future lives from the scourge of gun violence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda, for speaking today and for your insight. Amanda is also an honoree of this year from California legislature who recognized her for her commitment and work towards ending gun violence in America. And your work is beyond appreciated. We also thank all of you that joined us today for listening to her discuss the current state of gun legislation in California. Please join us for our next session starting at 7 p.m. right after this Eastern time and 4 p.m. Pacific time, which will discuss lobbying 101. The link to join the Zoom call is on our Brady website as well. Have a good evening, everyone.